This is uh, Jesus the God-man, Jesus in the book of John, lesson number 11, and the title of this lesson is Taking God at His Word. Now, of course, I've repeated at the beginning of every lesson in this series that John brings together three themes, intertwines them into his gospel. Jesus as the God-man, different ways that John demonstrates that Jesus is God and Jesus is also fully man. And then followed by reactions, people who react to that in faith. And then of course some who react in disbelief. Now these are the three themes that appear over and over again, but John's objective with this book is a very precise. Very rarely does any one of the gospel writers actually spell out what it is they're trying to accomplish with their writings. Um, but John does, of course, in John chapter 20, 30 and 31, he says, many other signs therefore Jesus also performed in the presence of His disciples, which are not written in this book, but these have been written that you may believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that believing you may have life in His name. You know, a pretty direct, pretty, you know, concise um, summary of why he is writing this book. And you don't find that in the, uh, the others. You, know, you have to kind of deduce it as you, as you go through it, but not with John. He spells it out. He's telling you why he's writing this book. Now, whether the people in the book that we read about, whether they believed or not, and whether all of Jesus' words and miracles are actually recorded in the book or not, that's, um, that's not the main objective. The main objective of his book is that the people who read the book will believe that Jesus is the divine Christ. And of course, that's us. In our generation, that's us. He's writing for us. Those of you, us, who are reading this, you'll believe that He is the Christ and that um, uh, that we have salvation through Him. That's why John is such a popular book to use when evangelizing someone, because it's so clear. You, know, you don't have to make the point with the person you're studying with. He's going to read it eventually. And all you have to do is, well, what do you think? <laughs> do you? Do you believe or not? So we're part of that group in the gospel that either believe or disbelieve. And the purpose of these profiles of believers and disbelievers is that we, the readers, might see ourselves in them. Who are we? You know, are, are, are we the Nicodemus types you know, who have a lot of knowledge but not quite sure? Are we that type? You know, are we the type, uh, are we the beggars you know, who had a rough life and so on and so forth and Jesus you know, turned our life around? Are we that person? So we can find ourselves in the various characters that John describes in his book. And so the purpose of the accounts of Jesus' ministry was to influence the reader to choose to believe over disbelieve. So we need to keep in mind as we study the book that we are not simply disinterested students examining some ancient record or events. We are participants because John had us specifically in mind when he put together this account of Jesus' life. He is writing to us. All right, so we're familiar with the three themes and the final objective of the book, which we are a part. Now I want to briefly review Jesus' own approach to making, not disciples, we talked about that, the woman at the well. Now I want us to look at Jesus' approach to making a witness about Himself. John describes the very human activities of Jesus. You know, we see him walking from place to place, eating. Uh, he describes Jesus as being tired and thirsty, very human. You know, these are human emotions, human feelings. We see a normal human being interacting with others and interacting with the world around him. You know, uh, John presents Jesus in that light, the God-man, okay, the man part. We're also, we also see, however, Jesus' divine nature from time to time as John presents this divine nature in a variety of ways. For example, he describes the witness concerning Jesus. In other words, 
in order to demonstrate Jesus' divine nature, he describes what other people were saying about Jesus. So these are things said about Jesus that witness or point to His divine nature. For example, John the Baptist, with his own special birth and prophet stature, witnesses concerning Jesus and His true nature, that He was the Lamb of God. So how does John get across the idea you know, we know how he gets across the idea that Jesus is human. How does he get across the idea that Jesus is divine? Well, first of all, by describing what people said about him, namely John the, uh, John the Baptist. Um, the witness from heaven was made about Jesus at his baptism. So John talks about the Father speaking and the Holy Spirit appearing, confirming Jesus as the Son of God. Another way that John demonstrates through witness that Jesus is the divine Messiah. And then of course, there's Jesus' own witness about Himself. What He said to the Samaritan woman, for example, He said, I am He, meaning He was the Messiah. So that was you know, one way that John puts forward the idea that Jesus is divine, by, by what other people said about Him and what Jesus said about Himself. Another way that John presents Jesus' divine nature is through the, the teachings of Jesus. You know, the teaching is like no other teaching, with authority. Uh, the teaching not only provides information, Jesus' teaching provided revelation. You know, I, I, as a teacher, provide information. I might even provide some information you don't know because I've had time to study it and you know, do some research and I might find some things that you hadn't heard before, but that's just, it's still information I'm transferring. I don't provide any revelation, but Jesus provided revelation, how things work in heaven. Well, <laughs> no man, no woman, no, no human being can bring you information about how things work in heaven except someone who comes from heaven. All right, that's the point I'm, I'm getting at. And we see this with Nicodemus, himself a respected teacher among the Jews, but he was totally eclipsed by Jesus' revelationary teachings, how the kingdom of God works, how you enter into the kingdom. We see it in the woman at the well who recognizes him as at least a prophet when she first hears him teach. And then later on, he's going to teach about his death and resurrection, which is confirmed by a voice from heaven in John chapter 12, verse 27. So in all of these and other examples, the people come to the conclusion that he is the Messiah um, simply from hearing him teach them. You know, the people in the Samaritan village, you know, in uh, chapter four, verse 42, what do they say? They say, and they were saying to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves and know that this one indeed is the savior of the world. Notice in the Samaritan village, he didn't do any miracles, I mean, other than the woman telling her about her life, but towards the village, he didn't, he didn't heal anybody. He didn't do any miracles, he simply taught. And they said, their witnesses, well, we know this is the Messiah, this is the Son of God, simply from the teachings. And then another way that Jesus' divine nature is revealed in John, through the miracles, of course. Now, I mentioned the miracles last because we're always quick to go to these first. Somebody say, well, how do you know Jesus, you know, Jesus is the divine Messiah? Well, what about the miracle? We always go there first. But I wanted to go there last, to show you that there were other ways that John did this. We forget or overlook the fact that Jesus was also proven to be the divine Messiah by witness, by teaching, as well as by miracles. Remember that many prophets and leaders in, in Israel had been instruments of God's power in the past. You know, there were prophets that did miracles. Elijah did miracles. Moses, many miracles were done through Moses. So doing a sign or a miracle did not automatically confirm Jesus as the Messiah. He did miracles and many of the people said, well, you know, he's a prophet, a great prophet, because that's, that's what the prophets did. So the witnesses about him and the teaching and prophecies that he made along with the miracles that's what closed the case 
concerning his true identity as the divine Son of God. And so there's a cycle within a cycle. The larger cycle, as you see in the diagram here, is Jesus' ministry and people's various reactions to His ministry. He ministers, some believe, some disbelieve. He ministers, some believe and disbelieve. He ministers, some, you know. There's that cycle that continually goes round and round throughout the book. And then there's a smaller cycle within that cycle that contains the various ways that Jesus demonstrates His divinity within His ministry. And so within the ministry, you have teaching, you have witness, you have miracle, you have teaching, witness, miracle, teaching, witness, miracle. And these two cycles continue uh, uh, throughout the entire book. Okay, so now that we've kind of stepped back to get a, a bit, a, an overview of the book and how it functions, let's go back, you know, let's, let's focus in, let's telescope in now, back to the text itself in chapter four. So if you have your Bibles, let's go to chapter four. Now these events are taking place uh, in chapter four early in Jesus' ministry. And if we were to chronicle His life, you know, what has happened so far till we get to channel, uh, channel four? <laughs> oh dear, chapter four. Uh, I do it by, by way of this little map here just to show where cities are located. Uh, he was born in Bethlehem and spent some time in Egypt before returning to settle in Nazareth, which is in the north, uh, near the Sea of Galilee. He traveled to Jerusalem in the south each year with his family to celebrate the Passover. Then as a grown man of 30, he lived in Capernaum, which is on the edge of the Sea of Galilee, the same town where Peter and his family lived. Interesting. Uh, in uh, Capernaum, uh, you have the, the, what's called the synagogue of Jesus. And what they have done, I mean, it was a small village, and uh, the villages had one, you didn't have five synagogues, you had one synagogue per village. And the archeologists have found the synagogue in Capernaum. Now, the synagogue that they found, this, this picture here, dates from the fourth century A.D. But the, the, the floor level, you know, it was built on top, you know, they built things, you know, one was taken down, they just built it on top. The flooring and the entrances are all the same as the first century uh, synagogue, where Jesus taught. And what's interesting is you can walk in and walk through that synagogue and walk in the same entrance way that Jesus walked in and the, the apostles and so on and so forth. Uh, during uh, that time. It's also the city where uh, Peter and uh, his family lived. And some speculate, there's no Bible support for this, but just a speculation that Jesus may have lived at Peter's, if you wish. He wasn't married, obviously. He may have lived at uh, Peter's house, but that's just speculation. Now, um, at that age, he came to the area around Jerusalem to be baptized by John, begin his ministry. Uh, we know he spent 40 days in the Judean wilderness in a spiritual battle with Satan. And that's a modern day picture of the wilderness. Has not changed a whole lot since that time. Uh, we think wilderness, we're thinking of you know, the Rocky Mountain pine trees and so on and so forth. Wilderness for them, this is wilderness, just rock. Rock and sand and stubble, no water, dry, extremely hot. Then after that he returned home. He attended a wedding at Cana, a town not far from Capernaum, and there he performed his first miracle. He goes to Jerusalem, he cleanses the temple, he teaches, he speaks with Nicodemus, he preaches and his disciples baptized where John the Baptist is working, and, though it, and then to avoid mounting opposition, he once again returns to the northern region. You know, they go to Jerusalem, he works there when things get a little too hot, he goes back to the north, to Galilee. And he goes back to Galilee by way of the Samaritan village. And he speaks to the woman there. And because of this, for two days he stays and he teaches the people. And so verse 43, chapter four, picks up the story from there. So let's pick up the story in verse 43. After two days, 
He went forth from there to, into Galilee, for Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things that he did in Jerusalem at the feast, for they themselves also went to the, to the feast. Now that his reputation is growing, and many are becoming his disciples, he goes back home to his you know, village in the, in the north. And it's, um, it's a fact of human nature that we rarely take seriously those who are from our own hometown until they make it big somewhere. That's especially true from you know, where I come from in Canada. You know, I, we've seen various, uh, you know, Celine Dion, you know, she was just a little pop star in Quebec until she made it big on the Johnny Carson show. And then when she came back from the Johnny Carson show, wow, she was really a big, it was the same girl, same songs, same everything, but she made it big in the United States. So all of a sudden, wow, she, she's really big now. And they, that, that idea of you have to make it away from home before your hometown appreciates you. Well, same thing here. In Jesus' case, he had been to Jerusalem, the big city. He had made his witness and miracles and teaching there. And now because of his reputation there, even the people of his hometown were impressed. Apparently some had seen or heard of his reputation in Jerusalem and they came home to spread the news. So Jesus is not looking for personal glory. He's not looking for fame but rather he's taking advantage of the situation so that he can preach to the people. Now, it's the same idea, uh, and I'll go into modern setting with you know, what we do. Uh, our uh, online, our website, uh, VBS, newspaper articles, any form of advertising that we do in the local church. These things don't convert people. I, I've been to budget meetings when people say, well, how many, you know, how many conversions did we get from the newspaper article or from the, the, web, the, uh, the church website? These things don't convert people. These things make us stand out among the others. They give us familiarity with the, with the community. People feel they know us because of the articles that uh, Marty writes, for example, or, the, or, or our website, or my teaching website, Bible Talk. And it also gives our members a bit of an edge when inviting somebody to church because people feel, well, they've already had contact with us in a, in a way. They saw the advertising in the paper, or they've been to our website, or whatever. You know, they, they feel they know us to a certain extent. So Jesus returns to his hometown where he's a celebrity of sorts because of the stir that he's caused in Jerusalem. So let's read what happens. 46, it says, Therefore he came again to Cana of Galilee where he had made the water wine. And there was a royal official whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and was imploring him to come down and heal his son for he was at the point of death. So John, you know, he skips over the rest of the journey and he picks up the story with Jesus you know, back in the city of Cana, obviously had perhaps relatives there, uh, the site of his first miracle. Doubtless the people have heard of his ministry in Jerusalem, but a lot of them are aware of the great sign that he performed at the wedding. Nobody knew during the time of the wedding, but after the wedding, people knew this. Don't you think the stewards didn't talk? So a royal official is a servant of the king, and the king at that time would have been Herod. Now the official was from Jesus' adult hometown of Capernaum, which was close by the shores of the Sea of Galilee. All right, to understand why would a royal official be in Capernaum, a small you know, fishing village? Well, Herod had many palaces. He had palaces, garrisons, fortresses throughout the land, and he was always building. He, he was a, Herod was a builder. I mean, he rebuilt the temple. You know, he, was, he loved these big projects. And it was not unusual to have his officials scattered at different posts throughout the land. So there was you know, apparently a post in Capernaum and one of his officials were there. So this man, let's focus on him. He's at the end of a painful episode as his son lies close to death. No cause is given. Now, Think about this guy. This was risky for a man in his position to do. You know, royal official Herod, you know, he's the one that cut off John the Baptist's head. He's not too friendly. 
and one of his officials publicly approaches Jesus. But he was a desperate father and desperate fathers will do desperate things to save their children. So in verse 48 it says, so Jesus said to him, unless you people see signs and wonders, you simply will not believe. And I've always had trouble with that. That's kind of harsh, isn't it? The guy is taking a chance, he's desperate, the kid's dying, and Jesus says, boy, what's the matter with you? If you don't see a miracle, you're not going to believe. You know, it seemed kind of harsh to me. But I want you to realize that even though it seems harsh at first, considering the circumstances, but there are reasons why Jesus answers the way He does. First of all, the man's motivation. The man did not come for Jesus' witness or for His teaching. He came in a desperate attempt to save his son. Now people who are, in the who are in danger of death will try anything to save their lives. Things that they would scoff at at other times. They embrace it uh, when they're desperate. My aunt, Rita, who died, I mean, you know, 50 years ago, uh, she had uh, breast cancer. And 50 years ago, it's not like today. You know, she, it started as just a small lump. And uh, my uncle was a bit of a, a naturalist, you know, believed in natural healing. Don't go to the doctor, nah, 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 nah. You know, and the thing just got worse and worse. And obviously she started to die, it was too late. They didn't have the type of surgery and radiation treatments they do today. But anyways, near the end, you know, she was taking a mixture of carrot juices, stuff she would have just laughed at before. She was desperate. They were trying all kinds of you know, mixtures of berries and so on and so forth. So you'll, you'll try a lot of crazy things you know, when, you're, when you're desperate. So this man that approached Jesus, he had a kind of faith, the faith that you have in faith healers, the faith that you may have in snake oil salesmen, the faith that is created out of desperation. It's faith, but it's not the kind of faith that Jesus wants us to have. And of course, the man's faith was incomplete. Jesus is commenting on the kind of faith which stood only on the witnessing of miracles. In other words, unless He wowed them with signs, they would falter and they would no longer believe. You know, we see that kind of faith, young Christians many times, people new in the faith, unless prayers are immediately answered, unless they continually experience the excitement of new faith, you know, like that new car smell. New faith has that new car smell. Unless they feel the comfort of the Spirit at all times, they'll doubt, they'll become discouraged. They, get, they begin to go back to the, to the world. They have no root in themselves, as Jesus talks about in the parable of the seeds. But mature faith is the one that perseveres, and here's the key. Mature faith is the faith that perseveres on Jesus' word. By, you know, Peter said, by your word, I will let down my nets. That's, that's mature faith. That's what we're shooting for. Mature faith is one that perseveres on Jesus' promise, on Jesus' presence, regardless of the feelings that we have or the circumstances that we're in. It's not the circumstances that I'm in that creates my faith. You know, things are going well, my faith is high. Things are going not well, my faith is low. Uh-uh, that's not mature faith. That's, that's just being tossed around by you know, waves, not of doctrine, but waves of circumstances. This, kind, this is the kind of faith that the Lord asks of the man, and He asks of us to take him at his word. So let's look at the miracle and what transpires. Verse 49 to 51 says, the royal official said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. And Jesus said to him, Go, your son lives. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and started off. And as he was going down, his slaves met him, saying that his son was living. So he inquired of them the hour when he began to get better. They said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. 
Now I want you to note that the man had asked Jesus to come with him in order to heal his son. And Jesus had done that in the past, didn't he? With the little girl, he went with them. And he went into the room and he touched the little girl. But here he just says, go, your son's fine. Jesus challenges the official to greater and more mature faith by taking him at his word only concerning the healing of his son. That was the challenge. If you believe, just, just go, but just take me at my word. I don't have to walk with you, go in, touch the child. You just take me at my word. Now, if you remember our last lesson on the seven steps of Jesus' personal evangelism method, which was, you know, I, said, I called it the multiplying method, I said that step one, contact. Well, contact has been made with this man through Jesus' reputation and signs. Step two, I told you, was challenge. And challenge has been given in the invitation to believe only the word that Jesus, you know, he had, he had this kind of faith. And Jesus wants him to step up to a more mature faith. So what does he do? He challenges him to just believe on his word, to step up. And it's amazing how many times the Lord asks us, you know, sometimes I can all, I, I'm not saying I hear the words, trust me on that one, but I can almost, the situation almost formulates the words in my mind that the Lord is saying to me, Step up, Michael. Step up. Man up in something. Dealing with a situation. Sometimes it's not just a situation of illness. Sometimes it's a um, conflict with another individual. And I have to step up and respond in a more Christian-like fashion, but it's going to be hard. It's going to require swallowing my pride. It's going to require you know, not getting closure, it's going to require maybe somebody might think I'm weak or I let myself be trampled on, you know? but the word that I'm hearing inside is step up. Step up to a more mature faith. Now we could go around in you know, 50 different situations, but I'm telling you, the Lord often is telling us to step up in our, in our faith. And so, we note in the passage that after the man responds to the challenge, he just turns around and he doesn't go, oh, but, 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 but. he just, okay. And he goes back. His faith is rewarded with the news that his boy has been saved and is recovering exactly as Jesus said. So the system is complete, 53 and 54. It says, so the father knew that it was at that hour in which Jesus said to him, your son lives. And he himself believed and his whole household. This is again a second sign that Jesus performed when he had come out of Judea into Galilee. So in these verses we see the completion of Jesus' personal evangelism system. You know, we see all seven steps in this account. I gave you all seven steps in the, the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. All seven steps are present here with the healing of uh, this man. Let me, let me just show you, let's go over them, okay? There was contact. And so the man knew Jesus by reputation and witness. So Jesus had made contact with him. There's challenge. The man is called to step up to a more mature faith in, in taking Jesus at his word. There's confirmation. When the father does so by returning home, he learns of the miracle done. Jesus confirms the man's faith. You were right to believe. I know this is almost, you know, it's self-evident, but it's always correct to step up. It's always the right thing to do, and I have always regretted not stepping up. I've always regretted you know, giving myself an excuse not to try harder, do this, give up this sin, give up this bad habit, uh, restrict myself, you know, <sighs> deny myself against all my rationalization. I've always regretted not stepping up. In other words, I've always regretted not accepting the spiritual challenge, whatever it was, because the Lord provides confirmation. For this man, the miracle was confirmed. Then there's the two, the call and the conversion. These are compressed into one action as the father reacts to the proof with belief in Jesus. 
Jesus calls on him to believe and we see the conversion. Consecration. He tells his household of the witness and the word and the miracle of Jesus. And number seven, multiplication. The entire household believes in Jesus. Jesus doesn't even go to the house. The man goes to the house. He explains. They may have thought that the son just got better by himself, but no, the, the man comes home and he says, you know, he explained what, what went on and they begin to believe. So what begins as a desperate man crying out to Jesus for help, you know, do something, turns into the conscious and mature faith of not only this man, but multiplied completely in his household. So let's summarize some of the key things that we've looked at today. Number one, Jesus demonstrates His true nature in three ways. His, the witness from Himself and other people. That's how John portrays, one of the ways that John portrays Jesus' divine nature, by what other people say. Also by the power of His teaching and the, um, the miracles. Those are the three ways that John demonstrates uh, Jesus' divine nature. So that's one of the things that we learn. You, 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 someone said, what did you learn about John today? Well, we learn that in the book of John, Jesus' divine ministry is demonstrated in a variety of ways. Another thing, the point of John's book is, the, is to bring the readers, that's us, to belief in Jesus as the divine Messiah. So we've, we've learned that point and we've also learned that John is a great book to read with someone who is you know, not yet a Christian, wants to know more about the Bible. I mean, any of the Gospels are terrific, you know, but John especially speaks to the people of today, very much so. And then another thing that we've kind of talked about and learned today is that mature faith takes God at His word. If He says, I'll take care of you, then I take Him at His word. If he says, I forgive you, I take him at his word. You know why? Because many times, long after God has forgiven us, our own heart continues to accuse us. Our own conscience continues to try to make us feel guilty. The evil one continues to whisper in our ear, you're not good enough, you don't really believe you've been forgiven, you, 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 you don't have a right to have joy and anticipation of heaven because you know that you're a sinner and come on, you know what I'm saying? So sometimes we, we have to take God at His word. If, I've always said, if God forgives you, then you can forgive yourself. But if God hasn't forgiven you, you can forgive yourself all you want. You'll still feel guilty and you still will be. And then of course, um, if God says, do this or don't do this, it's wise to take him at his word. A mature faith will act and it will persevere on the word and the word should be enough. Signs and miracles were given to make people pay attention, to lead them to Jesus and to lead them to his word. The man learned this lesson and every great servant of God from Adam to Paul the apostle and forward until now has learned that you can only do great things for the Lord, you can only know the Lord, you can only become fruitful for the Lord if you learn to act on His word and His word alone. Not how you feel, not how you perceive signs, not on what's new or what's safe or what others say or do, only on the word of God. Our entire future rests upon the word of God. God. Okay, I think that's an important lesson. Well, next week we're going we're to move on to chapter five, more of Jesus' ministry, more of His activities in the Galilean region. All right, that's it for today. Thank you.